Welcome back to Anatomy and Physiology on Catalyst University. My name is Kevin Tokoff. Please make sure to like this video and subscribe to my channel for future videos and notifications. This is the third video in a short series that I'm doing over uh, the brief history of lipids and how we initially thought that they were the causes of coronary artery disease, cardiovascular diseases of all kinds. And over time, we've kind of seen that cholesterol and saturated fat really are not the culprits in those. Um, really what the culprit is, is sugar. And in the previous video, which was part two, we discussed a lot of mechanisms about how sugar intake, especially when it's high levels of added sugar intake in the diet, lead to chronic insulin elevation, and that leads to a whole host of problems. So if you want more detail on that, please go back and watch that video. In this video, we're really just going to focus on how this leads to atherosclerosis. So I've got a schematic over here. Um, you can actually follow along on this. I'll be talking a lot about these. But before we do that, I want to do a brief review of some of the things that chronic insulin elevation will cause. Remember, chronic sugar intake, so very high sugar intake, well above what the body actually needs, leads to elevated insulin production by the pancreas. And that insulin production, when it's elevated chronically, creates a whole host of problems. LDL, this is normal LDL, is supposed to be larger and it's supposed to be low density. However, when you have chronic insulin elevation, what we actually see is there's a lot more small, dense LDLs. Okay, small, dense. These small, dense LDLs are abnormal. Number one, they have increased susceptibility to oxidation by free radicals. That's our reactive oxidative species, R, or ROS. Okay. The other problem with small dense LDLs is unlike the normal LDLs, which are too large, these smaller ones can easily fit through the gaps between endothelial cells that line a blood vessel. And so along with the reactive oxidative species, the small dense LDLs can end up inside the extracellular matrix of a blood vessel. And this is going to kind of lead us to where we see atherosclerosis. Now, how does atherosclerosis occur? Well, it can occur through multiple mechanisms, but generally we have chronic damage to the endothelial cell lining. This is caused by inflammation, and of course I mentioned in the previous video that inflammation is majorly caused by chronic sugar intake. Having a really high sugar intake for a long period of time gives you a high amount of inflammation that can damage these um, endothelial cells that line the blood vessel. And so when you damage those cells, that can actually uh, abnormally increase the size of the diameter of the gap between them. Okay? So small, dense LDLs will have an even easier time getting through those. Right? And those LDLs, small dense ones, they move into the extracellular matrix, which in this picture is down here in the white region. Um, remember, the extracellular matrix is deep to the blood vessel lining. Okay? Also remember, as I showed on the previous slide right here, if free radicals are present, those are our reactive oxidative species, that LDL is oxidized into the oxidized LDL, which we abbreviate LDL ox. And that's one form of modified LDL. So let's look at this picture right here. We've got circulating LDL. There's some things here that we're not really as concerned about. But this LDL can, if it's small and dense, can actually move into the extracellular matrix through the blood vessel lining. And in here, um, those free radicals are going to modify that LDL into modified LDL, which we're going to call here oxidized LDL because if you have those free radicals, remember, the small dense LDLs are susceptible to oxidation. But this process, this is a misconception that most people have, actually is going to occur in the extracellular matrix, not so much in the blood vessel lumen. Okay? So we have this modified LDL accumulation. Now, here's what's going to happen. The macrophages that are present in this area, remember macrophages are modified differentiated monocytes that take up residence in tissues like the matrix here. Those macrophages are going to intake the LDL that's oxidized through phagocytosis, but when they do that, when the macrophages uh, take up this modified LDL, that's going to cause them to differentiate into a new cell type, which we call a foam cell. The reason they're called foam cells has to do with the fact that when you look at them under a microscope, they kind of look bubbly and foamy. That's where they actually get their name. It has nothing to do with any kind of physiological foam. 
Okay, so when macrophages uptake this oxidized LDL, that causes them to differentiate into a foam cell. Now, foam cells can do three things. One, they can initiate an, an inflammatory response, which is not what you really want in this case. Um, you don't want inflammation in this area because it's going to lead to bad things, but that's just what happens. The other two things that happens are, number two, they burst, that, which means they undergo necrosis, so they basically explode, or number three, they undergo apoptosis. Okay. In any case, what happens when the cell dies and there goes apoptosis, all of the lipids that were contained in the LDL when it was oxidized, all those lipids end up kind of getting dumped into this area up here that's kind of on the other side of the blood vessel lining. So it's not in the lumen, it's still in the matrix, but the lipids kind of accumulate right here on the edge of the endothelial cells. Okay, And that's because the foam cells die. Right. So in either case, the excess oxidized lipids accumulate. They accumulate in this area uh, just deep to the blood vessel lining, and down here we see it progressed a lot more. And it forms what's called a lipid-rich necrotic core. Now the reason it's called this is because, first of all, it obviously has a lot of lipids. Those lipids are from the foam cells. Remember, the macrophages basically consumed the oxidized LDL, which had a lot of lipids in it. And then when they differentiate into foam cells, they die and basically release everything that was in them, which include all those lipids. The reason it has the name necrotic core is because, of course, the foam cells died. And so basically in the matrix right here, you have this giant lipid deposit called the lipid-rich necrotic core. The reason they accumulate like this is because of the hydrophobic effect. Remember, lipids are hydrophobic. They don't like to be around water. So all the lipids are going to kind of accumulate together. And that's what leads to this. Now notice what's happening here. So notice that this lining is no longer flat. What we have here is this kind of protrusion into the lumen of the blood vessel because this giant lipid-rich necrotic core is basically taking up space. Then what's going to happen over time is cells called fibroblasts, which are just cells that occupy the matrix and deposit proteins, they're actually going to deposit that collagen, one of the proteins, around the necrotic core. So you see here, these little lines are supposed to be collagen. You can see them interspersed around some abnormally located smooth muscle cells, um, but the collagen is designed to seal off the lipid-rich necrotic core. Now, this poses a problem for two reasons. One, obviously if you look at the blood vessel lining now, it's now protruding into the lumen of the blood vessel. That increases vascular resistance. So that means blood flow through this blood vessel, whatever it happens to be, is diminished. Because remember, if you decrease the diameter of a blood vessel, it has less blood flow through it and increases the pressure. Okay, That's a problem, especially if it's in the heart, particularly the coronary arteries. And so if you have a diminished diameter of that blood vessel, that artery, there's going to be less blood flow to that area and that can cause a heart attack. In fact, there's one artery in particular, has two names that you'll see. One of them is called the anterior interventricular artery, but the other name for it that some sources will use is the left anterior descending artery. And that artery is very important because that is the artery that is supplying the left ventricle of the heart. If you haven't done a lot with heart physiology, know that the left ventricle is the strongest muscle in the heart. Okay? Uh, it has to be strong because it's pumping blood to all of the tissues of your body. It's pumping it down to your abdomen, to your legs, to your arms, everywhere, basically. Okay? So it has to be strong. If you have this process going on inside that artery, this diminished diameter of that artery is going to increase the resistance. It's going to decrease the blood flow to that area of the heart, and it's going to cause ischemia. You're going to have diminished oxygen delivery to that area, diminished glucose delivery, and that is very bad. And so if your left ventricle can't pump blood to the rest of your body, uh, you're actually kind of screwed. And that's why uh, this particular occlusion has a lot higher mortality rate than, than do the other arteries of the heart. Okay? Not saying that those aren't bad, but this one's a lot worse. Um, so little aside there, but hopefully it gave you some clinical applications of this. Now this process can occur anywhere in the body. Okay? It's of course deadly if it occurs in the heart. Um, 
However, there's another thing that can happen in this area where you have this lipid-rich necrotic core. Um, in this region, the blood vessel lining is very susceptible to initiating a thrombosis. So a thrombosis is basically a blood clot, but that blood clot is attached to the vessel wall. Okay? Um, you may have heard of this term called deep vein thrombosis. This is basically a thrombosis or a blood clot, in other words, that forms in your lower legs that tends to form uh, when you have a lot of uh, chronic inactivity. Um, so if you're sitting a lot in conjunction with eating a very poor diet high in sugar, it predisposes you to having a higher risk of deep vein thrombosis. But in any case, a thrombosis can occur in any area where you have lipid-rich necrotic cores, and that's bad. The thrombosis itself limits blood flow, but what's really bad about it is if this thrombosis ruptures and this mass of platelets and red blood cells that's clotted starts moving through the vasculature, that's called an embolus. So an embolus is basically a blood clot, but it's moving through the blood. Thrombosis, or a thrombus, is situated stationary on the blood vessel lining. It has not yet broken off. If this ruptures and now it's moving through the blood as an embolus, it could end up going into a smaller artery, such as in the heart, or the brain, and it could cause a heart attack or stroke, respectively. So very, very, very bad. Um, sometimes if it ends up in the lungs, it can block an artery there and you end up with what's called a pulmonary embolism. Now, unfortunately, this process is not readily reversible. So if this already starts to happen, um, it's gonna be very difficult to reverse and it probably won't at all because this collagen that's deposited by fibroblasts is basically scar tissue. It's scar tissue, so that does not heal well at all. But if you wanted to stop this or prevent it from happening altogether, the best way you can do that is look at the evidence, so just stop eating crap. And the best way to do that is to lower your sugar intake, particularly the added sugars. Don't eat processed foods like sodas, butterfingers, like that. So eat your meats, eat your vegetables, eat your fruits, eat your eggs, drink water, but for the love of God, don't drink this stuff. Don't drink sugary sodas. It's so awful for you. If you have to drink a soda, drink a diet soda. Because I'm telling you, the sugar is going to kill you. So who's the culprit here? Is it saturated fat? Is it cholesterol? No, it's sugar. And again, I want to emphasize that this is not natural sugar. This is added sugar. Okay? This is not natural sugar. This is not even a natural food. Okay? You can go pick an apple off of a tree right now. You can eat the apple. That has sugar in it, of course, but it's natural sugar. Some vegetables have some natural sugar, but don't let sugar scare you, but let added sugar scare you. Right? So hopefully this gave you a good understanding of how atherosclerosis works. And if you want more details on the actual mechanisms of uh, cholesterol transport and regulation, go back and watch some of the previous videos in this playlist. Please make sure to like this video and subscribe to my channel for future videos and notifications. Thank you.